Today marks 10 years since the bombs first began to fall, marking the beginning of the war in Afghanistan. Jenna Lee is off today, but she recently sat down with the parents of Special Forces Sergeant Nathan Chapman, the very first U.S. soldier killed by enemy fire in that war. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. We're 10 years away from the, the beginning of the war on terror, and it, it feels like sometimes it's hard to remember uh, what that time was like in the weeks and months following 9-11. Uh, Will, can you tell me a little bit about what that was like for your family? Well, we, uh, it was only a month or so after 9-11. Uh, first off, I was, uh, had uh, throat cancer during that period of time, and I was taking radiation treatments and had just returned home from a radiation treatment on my throat when uh, I sat down and turned on the television to see the second plane go into the, the tower. We were, like every American, traumatized by what we saw that day. But within a, a month, we then learned that our son was somehow going to become involved because he uh, just said he was leaving and was being deployed and we may not hear from him for a while. It was several weeks until we did hear from him in, uh, oh, late November. And uh, at that point, he told us that he had been in some special training and that he was getting ready to, to leave. Uh, that was all he could tell us. And we didn't hear from him again until Christmas Day when he called us on a satellite phone. And at that point, he had a chance to talk to the entire family. During that conversation, it was clear from the timing that he was somewhere in the part of the world that uh, would fit Afghanistan, but he didn't tell us exactly where he was. But that was the last time anyone in our family talked with him. And Lynn, this wasn't Nathan's first dangerous assignment. No, it wasn't. No, no it wasn't. It wasn't. He was in uh, Panama. He was in Haiti. Uh, he was in the Gulf War as well. So, no, it wasn't his first at all. And it seems, again, according to some uh, of the stories that I've read about your son, uh, Lynn, that, that maybe initially no one really knew what he was headed for in life. Uh, he was born at Andrews Air Force Base, which, you know, again, when you're looking at the story, you think, wow, that maybe sets up a, a military career. But the path there wasn't necessarily a, a direct one, was it? No, he didn't, as a child, didn't express an interest in, in a military career at all. In fact, we were pretty surprised when he uh, told us he was going to sign up and go into the Army. If anything, we thought, well, maybe Air Force, but um, he just really hadn't expressed a, an interest in a military career. But we were pleased. We thought it was a good choice for him. Well, I mean, you're an Air Force guy, so... Uh, right. Well, we talked, we, yeah, we talked about him uh, going in the Air Force. I talked about him going in the Air Force. And he said he didn't think that that's what he wanted to do. Uh, he was, quite frankly, I think the fella wanted to defend his, our country. He wanted to be involved actively uh, in that. And uh, I think he thought the Army offered him that best opportunity to do it. And uh, as you can see from his short career, he was in 13 years and had four separate combat environments, if you want to count Haiti as one, although that wasn't officially combat. Uh, and he did that in, in a 13-year period. Also in that 13-year period, uh, he, as you mentioned, a great deal of service. He gets married. He has two young children, ages two and one, uh, when he ends up deploying right. to Afghanistan. And I'm going to kind of fast forward to that moment, Will. I read that, that his wife at the time uh, told a reporter that he said to her, I have a 50-50 chance. I have a 50-50 chance of returning her, from Afghanistan. So. In some ways, it almost suggests a, maybe a premonition of just how dangerous the situation was. Uh, did, did you all have any indication of, of just how dangerous the situation would be? Uh, I don't think we had a good appreciation for it, but having made that statement, I know from conversations that I had with Nathan in the uh, late 90s when he was home on, at Christmas that he was pretty good at assessing the risks that he was uh, that he was taking, 
And for him to say that, I think he had a pretty fair idea that they were in a very dangerous situation over there when they went in. And so tell us a little bit uh, about that day then, Will, when, when they did get into trouble and your son died. The, uh, the team had been involved in a meeting with a local tribal leader in the area of coast and uh, which is close to the Pakistani border. And after leaving that meeting and uh, getting back into their vehicles, uh, it was at that point that uh, uh, fighting broke out and, and they were fired upon. Nathan was hit almost immediately. One of the CIA operatives was also wounded. Um, Lynn, right. when, when did you first learn about his death? Well, it was January 4th. and. Uh, I had just gotten home uh, not long ago. I had been out playing golf, and uh, someone came to the door. Uh, from They sent two soldiers from uh, Fort Hood, that is the nearest um, uh, base to us, and um, they, they told me. Then Will came home sometime after that, and then I told him. When you think about that day, 10 years, uh, it's not 10 years yet, but it will be 10 years come this, this mm -hmm. January. Right. Right. Uh, how, how is that even to, to think about? Um, it's very vivid even, even yet. You just don't forget a day like that. Uh, that day and the, the, the days right after that are very vivid and, and um, they're hard, hard to remember. Uh, in preparation for this uh, interview with you, we went through a lot of the uh, photographs and, and uh, things that were taken uh, during that period of time, it, it really stirred up a lot of uh, emotions. And Will, I understand that when you were going through a few of the items, that, y that you actually found a, a small flag. And there's a, there's a really special story behind this small flag that, that you found, and I was hoping that you'd be able to share that with us. Yes. Uh we keep it in the flag case with the, uh, the flag that we were given at Nathan's funeral. Uh, about six months after Nathan's death, I received a phone call from an Air Force tech sergeant. And uh, he said that he had been in Afghanistan and was getting ready to go back. And he said that he, had, he knew he had to make this phone call before he went back, but he had been reluctant to make it. What he had to tell me was that he was the loadmaster on the plane that picked up our son's body in the field and he said at the time there was no flag available so he took the flag off his uniform and laid it on Nathan's body and uh, he asked me if we would like to have that flag and uh, I told him we would and he sent it to us. Will, I'd like to just ask you about one photograph that we got in particular and it's a, it's a photograph of you saluting your son's casket. Can you walk us through exactly what was happening at that time? Uh, shortly after we arrived in, uh, we, we arrived in, in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington before Nathan's body was flown back from uh, Europe. And uh, we were there then at the time that the plane carrying his body arrived at SeaTac Airport. And uh, we, along with friends and, and other family who were there uh, at that time, uh, the Army took us out to the hangar where they were bringing uh, his body to and, and it was received by uh, almost a full contingent of the uh, First Special Forces Group soldiers and an honor guard as well as uh, the pallbearers who, who were there not only for that event but for Nathan's funeral. And we were asked to go up to the casket uh, just before it was put into a hearse after coming off the airplane. And as I stood at the foot of it, I just thought I needed to honor him that way. We're still at war. Obviously, our people are still dying. There seems to be a feeling that the political will and even the will of the public is waning when it comes to this conflict. And, and Will and Lynn, I'm just wondering how it feels for you. Um, this has been a part of your life, obviously, for the last 10 years. And what is that like, to, to, see, to see that that happening? Well, 
I hate to see us quit without finishing the job that we started out to do. I guess the question is, what is the job that we're, we're trying to do? Uh, in my mind, uh, we went over there so that this country would not be uh, attacked again in the way we were on 9-11 of 2001. Uh, up to now, that has not happened again. So from that standpoint, what we've done over there has been successful as far as that goes. Now, have we created an environment over there where it can no longer be a safe haven for people who would do us harm? Uh, I don't know if we have or not, but that's what I think needs to be done, is that we need to make sure that we leave that country in a way that no one is able to do the same thing to us again.